Sign up with my bookie. Use our promo code Gators to get your first ever deposit match dollar for dollar. Bet anything, anywhere, anytime with my bookie. Want more Gators Breakdown? Join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shout outs, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to GatorsBreakdown.supportingcast.fm to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. First show of 2022. Here we are. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Hopping on here on a Monday night is co-host Will Miles. You can find him on Twitter at Will Miles SCC and his site, Read and Reaction. YouTube, you read and reaction as well. Will, happy 2022. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, uh, obviously, we got Omicron spiking everywhere right now, but hopefully this is a milder version of the coronavirus and 2022 will not be marred in the same way that 2020 and 2021 were but uh 2021 was a good year for us right i mean we had oliver so he's almost a year old now and uh you know so i i can't complain at the end of the day i think individually 2021 was a really good year hopefully that was true for a lot of our listeners out there and if it wasn't then hopefully 2022 has a lot of good things in store for everybody out there absolutely big year for gators breakdown well well over a million listens and views uh i did the numbers on the last day of the year uh, there, so I had no idea it was anywhere near that high. <laughs> uh, coaching changes, uh, you know, help help along with that a bit there. But so everybody, uh, thank you so much there for all the uh, all the views and listens and interactions, uh, sharing of the podcast it means a whole lot here. Uh, but big big thanks to you for a big 2021 and hopefully an even bigger 2022. Well, Will, it feels good to uh, be behind the mic. Uh, we we haven't there's been no Gators breakdown episode since the. Uh, Gasparilla Bowl uh, versus UCF that night. Uh, we got together uh, pretty late after the game and, and, and reviewed that game. But I uh, took a week off, went up to South Carolina uh, to see my wife's side of the family, visited uh, my side of the family for you know Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and all that. So a, a lot of lot of lot of time spent with family. But 2022 is here. We'll uh, we'll be you know we'll slow it down a little bit as well. You know it is quote unquote, the off season uh, right now. But with everything going on, Fast and Furious news, we'll get into all of it today. Players leaving, uh, players coming in, new coaches, new staff coming in as well. Well, it's, it's, it's not going to slow down for the, – the news cycle won't slow down. Like I said, we'll, we'll slow down a bit without, without actual games to talk about, but still plenty to discuss while Billy Napier fills out this staff. Yeah, I mean, anybody who's new joining us is going to find out that we find plenty of stuff to talk about during the <laughs> off season, and that your moniker of uh, you know never a dull moment in Gator Nation that is definitely true. There's always something going on. There's some angle to to look at when it comes to the program, and and uh, you know w- we find a way to fill an hour no matter what it is, man. So uh, you know, I I know you've you've been doing all the spaces and all that sort of stuff for for Gators Breakdown Plus, and I know people have really enjoyed that in the Discord chat that's associated with that too. So I'm sure that'll probably go on all throughout the off season as well but as far as us finding stuff to talk about i don't think that'll be a problem new staff a whole new whole new batch of players new people to analyze it'll be fun this off season yeah will and i have already started diving into the the, the defense we've uh, tra- traded a little bit of uh background stuff on patrick tony that we've been going back and forth with so when we really get to dive deep into you once the staff is filled out once we know who's on the roster and, and all that kind of leading up maybe to spring practice and kind of what to, to look out for. So uh, we'll be, you know, diving into Billy Napier's offense and Tony and whoever else is on staff. We'll get into that this episode too. Uh, we'll do some deep dives on the, on both sides of the ball coming up in the next uh, few weeks, few months here on Gators Breakdown. But well, like I said, plenty to get into. But before we do, everybody hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you're not already subscribed here on Gators Breakdown. It really helps us a lot. And you can find us at news4jacks.com/slash/gators-breakdown. For all your Gators coverage, and if you're a Jaguars fan, yeah, we're in Jacksonville. I know uh really tough right now, but uh, coaching search going on for the Jags is 
Jags as well. So you can keep it tuned to News 4 Jacks for all your Jaguars coverage as well. So, all right, Will, let's get into it. Let's go. We haven't really discussed the roster and all the roster moves happening a whole lot lately uh, for the Gator team because we've been caught up with, you know, the bowl game and a lot of the staff uh, that's coming in for, for, for Billy Napier. So, well, let's get into it just a bit. Brenton Cox, Ventrell Miller, Justin Shorter all returning for Florida this uh, in Billy Napier's first season. So good that you get some experienced players on both sides of the ball here uh, for Billy Napier and look, some leadership roles uh, for, for, for this um, this team as well. Um, but look, we'll, we'll get into it um, for Brenton Cox, you know, it may, it, you can, you can, you can pair it with it if you want, or maybe not, but you know, he decided to return to Florida for one more season. That uh, right, right after that was kind of known. we we'll get word. Chris Bogle is going to transfer out of the program. He goes uh, and, and leaves Florida, whether that's related to Brenton Cox or not, not really sure. Uh, but discussing Cox uh, right here, uh, look, the critiques of, uh, of him, I think, a little bit overblown. I mean, he certainly can get better in the consistency category, uh, but still too aggressive at times. Either leaves a hole or over pursues, uh, but did lead to lead the team in sacks eight and a half this past season. Excited to see his potential in this new scheme and these new coaches. Um, Co defensive coordinator Patrick Tony. He has more of a defensive uh, defensive backfield background. Will. Uh, some with outside linebacker this past season at Louisiana. Some uh, some elements of that position, of course, bleed over into that rush in buck. Uh, however, they will define that position in this defense. Uh, but with Cox's return at, at rush in, he only joins Lloyd Summerall, who is returning <laughs> for, for Florida. We got that. He put his name in the transfer portal. He's coming back, uh, decided not to transfer. So you pair Cox with Lloyd Summerall and Juan Powell for that role of that rush in. And, yeah, you heard right. Roy Summerall taking his name out of the portal. Needed to gain some weight. Last listed, 6'5", 247. So he put some on. There would certainly be an opportunity there for Lloyd Summerall as well with Bogle leaving. But, Will, I mean, starting with Brenton Cox here, him returning, Florida's got an experienced SEC player at that rush-in position. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting if you look at Cox's splits. A lot of his production last year was in the last four or five games of the year. Yeah. He came into the year, and everybody was very concerned about that foot injury. You do wonder whether that foot injury, he even alluded to being fully healthy there or at least go. looking forward to what he can do next year when he's fully healthy. And you look at it, he had one sack all the way up through the South Carolina game, then had one against Samford, one against Missouri, four against Florida State, and one against Central Florida, and I think was more consistently getting to the quarterback. So he had four tackles for loss against Central Florida as well. So he had, what, eight, nine, ten, eleven tackles for loss there in the last five games of the year. If he can do that consistently in, in 2022, then he's going to be a you know first or second round draft pick if he's getting you know four or five tackles for loss on a regular basis. And so he's got an opportunity to significantly increase his draft stock. I think the criticism are valid, right? The criticisms of not necessarily setting the edge on the run, especially in games against opponents who are phys more physical. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of having a motor that's sometimes on and sometimes off. Those are, those are the criticisms. And he's going to have a year to um, prove that that was a criticism of Todd Grantham's defense and Brenton Cox within Todd Grantham's defense, as opposed to it being a true criticism of Brenton Cox. And we'll see what he can do. Obviously, there's a lot of money on the line for him coming up this year. And so I expect yep. him to come out and, and, and play very, very well and full motor all the time. And, and especially if he's fully healthy to be able to do that. So I'm excited that Cox came back. Obviously you don't like that you lose Bogle, but you know, one of the things we knew when they made a transition from Dan Mullen to Billy Napier is that there were going to be guys who decided to leave the program. And, you know, like you said, it sounds like Napier has, uh, has talked some people into coming back into the program as well. And so you've lost a few, but you've gained a few chances. Are you going to lose a few if Dan and Mullen had stayed, right? So yeah. uh, maybe it's a different set of people, but you would have lost people if, if Mullen had stayed just because that's the way the transfer portal works this, this you know, uh, in this day and age. And so, uh, you know, I'm excited to see. I mean, Brenton Cox, we've been excited about his ability for now two or three years, and we just started to see it towards the end of 2021. So if he can turn it on in 2022, it'll be really nice if he can have a year like John Grenard did a couple of years ago where just every time the defense goes out there, you are – your thought process is they're either going to have to double team him, which is going to open up everybody else, or he's going to get to the quarterback and we're going to get some turnovers from it. And, you know, we haven't had that the last couple of years. That's one of the, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why the defense has struggled. 
Yeah, so good to have him back. And maybe the headline here because of his five-star uh, history transferring from Georgia as well with, with that five-star uh, status there. But maybe, Will, maybe the biggest out of all this and maybe the most unexpected out of all of this, linebacker Ventro Miller would get the news that he's returning, coming back to Florida. Look, this is big, I think, for Billy Napier in year one. The big for Florida, getting an experienced leader back on the field uh, with all the transition that's happening with the coaching staff. I think, you know, we'll look for him to, you know, be someone that this new staff and players can rely on. You know, I think Florida missed his his voice as a leader on the field last year, a defensive play caller. And look, it for it forced some guys to to at that linebacker position to probably play more inside than originally planned when Florida's going all throughout uh, fall fall practice. Jeremiah Moon, of course, and 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 Mamoudi Abate, you know, those guys had to play more interior once Miller went down early in the season. Uh, and you know, finally, finally, they switched to Tyron Hopper probably a little bit too late. And you saw what he was able to do as he got more playing time uh, on the field into the season pretty well versus UCF before uh, getting thrown out of that game. But uh, look, I think you got a potentially a, 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 a lot of potential here for a pretty good one two punch with Miller and Hopper uh, there. Add Derek Wingo, Scooby uh, Williams out there. That's a nice nucleus for the 2022 se- season. We'll see what happens with Mamou Diabate. He tweeted uh, tonight, right before we went live. Um, you know, he put he has put his name in the portal. All his tweet says is tomorrow. So is that a decision coming from Mamou Diabate? We 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 uh, I think I'll, I'll try and kind of follow up here throughout this episode to kind of see uh, maybe what um, the thought is there. But put his name in the portal. Has not made a decision as of this recording. We'll see what happens on Tuesday. Uh, but, Will, maybe this move of Ventrell Miller coming back, you know, if Mamou Diabate talks to Billy Napier, maybe they come up with a plan. Does he stay at linebacker? Does he maybe move back out to a rush-in spot? We've just talked about the kind of maybe depth there, Bogle leaves. You don't have a lot of options at that r- r- rush-in spot behind uh, Brenton Cox there that's really, really proven. But, of course, Mamou Diabate really wouldn't be either <laughs> since he's been playing linebacker the last couple seasons. So, you know, he played his freshman season kind of in that role. But we'll see. A little bit of a little bit different defense than what, what they're asking these players to do here, Will. Uh, but Ventro Miller, I'll tell you, just as far as a leader, an experienced guy, somebody, the, the physicality that he brought uh, when Florida was getting – you know, Florida missed that versus LSU and South Carolina and Georgia when those teams are running up and down the field on Florida. Florida missed that kind of tough mentality there. Uh, you know, maybe not an overall great linebacker, but uh, not so sure teams would have ran on Florida much uh, like they did uh, if Ventral Miller's out there. So but I do like it as a transition, Will, of trying to, you know, with a with a new coaching staff, a, fa- a familiar face on this defense that I really think uh, this coaching staff and these players can really go to uh, for uh, maybe somewhat of an easier transition on defense. Yeah, I mean, I think Ventral Miller's a good player. I, I think the um... – but I'm not I'm not as surprised as you are maybe that he came back. In fact, him and Kamori Gamble are the two sort of super seniors because of the COVID year that I think probably have the opportunity to take advantage of that. You know, Cox coming back surprised me quite a bit, actually. I figured the way he finished, you know, the transition in coaching staffs, the fact that he trans- transferred to Florida in large part because of Todd Grantham. I said, okay, well, you know, he's probably somebody who's going to leave and that'll probably open things up for a guy like Chris Bogle. Obviously, that's not what happened, but I think Cox would have gotten drafted. I don't think he probably Probably would have been drafted where he wanted to be drafted, but he would have gotten drafted. I don't think Ventral Miller was getting drafted after this year. And so coming back in some respects is is really an acknowledgement of that. Now, you know, one of the interesting things about college football at this point is because you don't have to sit because you don't have to sit out, you still have to decide is Billy Napier the right person to play for? Is Patrick Tony still the right person to play for? Or is there someplace else in the country that will use my skills and abilities in a better way if I transfer there? And he would have had the opportunity to do that. So the fact that he stays at Florida, I think is a feather in the cap of the guys who are who are recruiting, you know, the 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 returning players, because that's one of the things with the transfer portal is whenever you have a transition like this, you don't just have to go recruit the new players. You've got to recruit all the old ones back as well. And, and so I think this is indicative of that. Now, yes, having leadership out there on the field will be a very important thing. Having multiple linebackers in depth at the linebacker position will be an important thing. But I think we saw the future of the linebacker for 48ers with Tyron Hopper there in, in the last three or four games of the year. 
And so, you know, I, whether or not they can find a way to put Ventro Miller and Hopper on the field at the same time yeah. is going to be the challenge for those guys. And maybe when you're playing a team like LSU where all they're running is counters, then bringing in a, a bigger linebacker who's willing to put his put his body on the line there and the hole makes a difference. What I would say, though, is that, um, you know, once you start throwing against the linebackers, at least when Florida played Alabama last year, Ventral Miller was, was able to be exposed there a little bit in coverage. And so, um, you know, he's got some limitations, but he's got a lot of experience, a lot of playing time. And I think his, his teammates all look up to him and all of those things are valuable, especially when you're going through transition. We sort of talked about this when down Mullen came in and Felipe Franks was the starting quarterback. You know, if it was a tie between him and Kyle Trask, he probably went with Felipe Franks just because Franks had the respect to the locker room because of the way he'd handled that 2017 season when Jim McElwain had sort of thrown everybody under the bus. And I, you know, obviously that isn't the situation here, but a guy like Ventral Miller is somebody who's going to have the ear of all the younger guys in the locker room. And so that's an important thing to have, especially if he's fully brought in to what Patrick Tony's teaching and what Billy Napier's teaching. All right. Looking there, Ventral Miller. And well, you brought up a good point too. I would be interested, you know, it is, Probably a lot dependent on who you're playing and what they're trying to do. Uh, you know, Miller, Hopper on the field at the same time. And I think, you know, you probably you, you split those guys, I think, with with Wingo uh, a bit, maybe Scooby too. Probably guys that are a little faster, a little more mobile, as you said, especially if you're going to have a team that's going to start throwing the ball. So how much we actually see Hopper. I, I think Hopper's better in coverage from what I saw than Miller. So probably you probably could – put them on the field a good bit at the same time, but also split time with those guys playing the more, you know, strong middle uh, linebacker and then kind of uh, one of the other uh, guys filling in uh, the other linebacker spot. Of course, you know, we'll, we'll see how many linebackers are on the field in this defense too. Um, more than likely two, a lot like, you know, Florida did under Grantham as well, but uh, you know, we'll see. I just think it's going to be, um, Tony's pretty flexible uh, in, in his defense. He'll change some things as well, not necessarily set uh, in, in a certain style. So we'll see uh, where that goes and what that means for Florida's linebackers as well. So uh, we'll, we'll move to the other side of the ball. Justin Shorter announced he's returning as well. Gives the offense a boost uh, for a very questionable receiving core. Uh, look, he tied Jacob Copeland, team leading 41 catches. Really came on at the end. You talked about splits earlier in Britton Cox's numbers. Justin Shorter was another one who really came on toward uh, the end of the year. Most of his stats, um, when you used to look, look at it, he made some nice catches, made some nice contributions toward the later part of the season. Thankfully, he looked, you know, it looks like recovered from that hit toward the end of the uh, UCF Gasparilla Bowl game. Uh, so he'll be the leader of, of that wide receiver group that returns bodies, but. No one that really stands out among you know, Henderson, Whittemore, Frazier, Weston, Burke, Reynolds. I mean, there's your wide receiver core right there, uh, Will. So not necessarily anybody who jumps off the page at you. A lot of names, a lot of contributors, but still looking for that big playmaker. Uh, can you know, can Justin Shorter live up to that five-star potential when he's coming back for one more year? Yeah, it was interesting. Shorter seemed to have a real connection with Emory Jones, and then Copeland seemed to have a real connection with Anthony Richardson. And with Richardson being the presumed starter in, in 2022, it'll be interesting to see whether he and Richardson can build that same chemistry because it definitely felt like when Anthony Richardson came in the game that he was looking for Jacob Copeland and that you know a lot of the long touchdowns that were thrown by Anthony Richardson went to Jacob Copeland. I mean, you know, so um, it'll be interesting to see whether that chemistry can be built up between the two. But um, you know, the reality is, is that one of the things that we don't really know about the Florida offense and the Florida wide receivers is how much of it was the receivers and how much of it was Emory Jones. Because if you look at the game against UCF and the Gasparilla Bowl, I mean, I, I would say that Trent Whittemore should have had a <laughs> should have had a 45 yard touchdown reception. And I would have said Justin Shorter should have had like a 65 or 70 yard touchdown reception. And when you miss those things, well, now all of a sudden, instead of you know, 42 receptions for 625 yards, shorter sitting at 41 for 550 and, and the per the average per catch is going way, way down. And so, um, I think Shorter was able to get behind the defense. Actually, he's been able to get behind the defense um, against Oklahoma a couple years ago in the bowl game, and then also now. A couple years ago, he was the one dropping the ball when it was put in there pretty well. This past year, I think he was missed more often than 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 we'd like. And and the, the shots weren't taken sometimes as well when they were there. So we'll see. I mean, obviously, I think he 
has the pedigree to do that. He's a big guy. So even just throwing the ball up, in fact, at the back end of the Gasparilla Bowl, Emory Jones started making back shoulder throws to Jacob Copeland and to Justin Shorter, and all of those were successful in moving the Gators down the field. I think we'll probably see more of that next year just because if you get a guy one-on-one on the outside who's Justin Shorter's size, you ought to be able to get a completion out of that. Um, so, But like you said, I mean, he's got 41 catches. You've got Copeland leaving who had 41. you got Malik Davis leaving who had 23. Damian Pierce had 19. Work Wells is leaving with 24. Gamble mm-hmm. maybe comes back with 31, but then you got Xavier Henderson at 26, Whittemore at 18, and Zipper at 11. Nobody else had more than five. And other than Marcus Burke, who only had two catches, nobody had a per catch average above 13.6 out of all the guys who were who were in that list. And so we haven't seen any explosion, right? I mean, even when you think about Kadarius Tony a couple of years before his breakout season, he was still averaging 15, 16 yards a catch even when he was only getting eight, nine, 10 catches. And then all of a sudden he's able to get that to translate. I don't think we see that here. And that'll be the question, right? The question is, is was it the quarterback or was it the receivers? I think the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. I think the receivers this past year were less effective than the, certainly less effective than Kyle Pitts and Kadarius Tony. Um, but even, you know, the year before where we had all the seniors, I think they were probably less effective than them too. At the same time, I think obviously when you look at Kyle Trask and the downgrade to Emory Jones' performance this year, you can say that some of it's on the quarterback as well. So uh, a welcome addition, obviously, anytime you've got a receiver out there with 41 catches and that sort of experience. And not only 41 catches, but he's basically been a starter the last two seasons. And so, you know, Shorter is also an important part of the run game or at least an extension of the run game because he blocks an awful lot. He's a big dude who can get out there and block. And you have to block in Dan Mullen's scheme. And so if Napier asks people to do that, then Shorter is certainly somebody who will be able to do that and do that well. We are talking about the transfer portal. We cannot talk about the transfer portal and leave out what, you know, what, <laughs> we've been discussing it, at least on the Gators Breakdown Plus side and the Discord uh, server side of, you know, Emory Jones. Uh, of course, there was the reports he was putting his name into the transfer portal, but he never did officially. Uh, we've been talking about that on the Gators Breakdown Plus Discord for the last couple of weeks there. Uh, and that, uh, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that he is going to uh, leave Florida. So, still as of today was not officially in the transfer portal. Look, I don't think he's going to be starting quarterback uh, for Florida there. Could he be a depth piece? Could he be a, a change of position guy that I don't really buy into? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it, you just don't snap your fingers and all of a sudden he can catch a ball and be a receiver uh, or, <laughs> or running back. So you know, we'll, we'll see where, where, where it goes with that. I don't think, you know, if he does come back to Florida, probably close to graduating. I don't think uh, necessarily it is, uh, hey, you're starting quarterback. I think, uh, you know, looks for me, AR, uh, the guy, as long as healthy, we roll around the spring. Uh, but worth bringing up about Emory Jones and not necessarily uh, the decision right now of uh, whether he is going to leave Florida. I mean, a decision would have to come soon. I would expect that this week uh, we'd get the announcement. But um, as of today, Will, still not officially in the transfer portal and some talk there that uh, he just may not be out of the door just yet. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an interesting concept because the transfer portal doesn't mean you're transferring. It just means other schools have the ability to contact you. So this isn't a situation where, like, he got contacted and doesn't like his options. Like, they haven't been allowed to contact him because he hasn't gone into the portal, which is an interesting development and certainly something that I think we all thought was probably unlikely, right? Is he? I don't think you can sustain him as a starting quarterback. I think he proved that that that's going to be an issue unless there's major development and growth during this offseason. But again, maybe Napier gave him that promise, right? And said, look, we'll give you an opportunity to win the job. We're coming in clean slate. And if Emory Jones thinks that he's the more talented of the guys on the team and thinks that he can outwork the people who are there, then maybe he thinks that's his best opportunity to sort of not redeem himself, but but build up a resume that somebody in the NFL would take a look at. Because that's the thing is, you know, if you go play at, at a Division two school or if you go play, you know, let's say he transferred to a Sunbelt school or something like that, you're kind of following the Jeff Driscoll pathway which yeah. may mean you end up getting drafted, right? I mean, Driscoll's had a successful NFL career when it comes to being able to stick on rosters and play a few games and start a few times and those sorts of things. But it's not necessarily the road to glory that everybody wants. And so, mm-hmm. you know, Emory Jones is sort of – he's really he's really walked to the beat of a different drummer his entire Florida career. 
Like a lot of guys would have left when Kyle Trask was brought in as the starter when Felipe Franks got hurt. Um, a lot of people would have left when they knew Kyle Trask was going to come in in 2020 and play and say, hey, I'm going to go figure out what I want to do elsewhere. Instead, he was patient and he stayed. And, and that sort of indicates a different level of, I don't want to say maturity, but just a different way of making decisions than most of the other people who are out there. And so this is a different way of making a decision, right? And I think one of the things that Napier's goal has always been to, even with recruits, it was, well, just give me some time, right? Don't sign in December. You don't have to sign with Florida in December, but wait until February so that we can get to know each other. And in some respects, that might be what this is, right? Is, hey, take some time, get to know me. If you put your name in the transfer portal, plenty of people will be interested in you. And, you know, you're not missing out on spring practice if you wait until, you know, the end of January to put your name in the transfer portal. Let's build a relationship. Let's learn about each other and figure out whether it'll work. And that's probably what this is. And, you know, like you said, I don't think we see him as the starting quarterback or at least the solution at starting quarterback next year. It's hard to make a, make a position change at the same time if you want what's best for yourself as an NFL player, I think what we saw this year suggests that a position change is probably the best path to the pros when, when it comes to Emory Jones. And so, I, you know, I wouldn't put it past him, right? He, he is, he has some, he doesn't have the explosion that I thought he would have. Like when he got past the defense, he didn't just like all of a sudden split two defenders and, and, and take it to the house. I thought he was going to have more of that. He hasn't shown that, but what he has shown is really good vision when he has an opportunity in the hole to pick up a couple of yards when a couple of, when it doesn't look like a couple of yards are there, those sorts of things. And so guys with vision, guys with patience, guys who understand how to set up blocks are valuable commodities, even if it's just throw a bubble screen out to them. And then you can run gadget plays off of that because obviously he can throw the ball. So there are some opportunities to use him. Um, I, I don't know that it's the ideal scenario for – for Florida to have him there just because it sort of makes things murky. But, you know, Napier seems to want competition. And if you've got Emory Jones in the fold with Anthony Richardson and now with, uh, with Jack Miller, you know, there's going to be competition for that starting job. And, and, you know, hopefully the competition ri rises all boats, right? That, that uh, you know, the, those guys competing against each other will make them all better as opposed to forming a situation where people start, uh, start, you know, uh, the the teammate situation this year was good. I don't know whether that can sustain in the next year and the year after. And so, you know, we'll see. That's that's one of the reasons that Napier gets paid the big bucks is he gets to figure out how to how to manage all this stuff with the uh, with the roster that he has. Uh, Will you mentioned Jack Miller? Let's get into some incoming transfers uh, from the transfer portal. Jack Miller, Cameron Waits. Cameron Waits uh, was announced today. But let's get to Jack Miller first. While we're kind of discussing uh, quarterbacks here, transfers from in, transfers in from Ohio State. A um, little bit of background from Napier and Miller when Napier was at Arizona State as offensive coordinator there under Todd Graham. Uh, joins Anthony Richardson, Carlos Del Rio, Jalen Kitna, of course, on the depth chart. Maybe Emory Jones. We'll see what happens there, as we just discussed, You know, co to compete this spring. I can't imagine all those guys <laughs> on, on the uh, quarterback depth chart when it's all said and done. So, you know, as long as they are as healthy, as I said, you know, he, he'll lead the competition. I expect to win the job as starter. No, you know, we're not breaking any news. No, that's not stepping on any kind of ledge there. Um, Miller, four-star quarterback when he was a recruit, redshirted in 2020, saw very limited action this this past season for Ohio State. Will, the most you'll see out of him, and what I went back and looked at, there's a full um, video on YouTube of just him in Ohio State spring game uh, this past spring in 2021. I watched that. Look, nothing really stands out. Very conservative approach in that spring game, not really throwing deep or two guys in stride um, as the receivers are, are, are facing him on most of the throws. Short throws, check downs. Now, like as I said, spring game format, very tough to weigh and take too much away from that. But going back and looking at that, Will, nothing really jumped off the page in that uh, Ohio State spring game. Yeah, I mean, so you know how I like to evaluate quarterbacks. As you go back to the high school statistics, I think that's where it starts at least to start to get a feel. And his freshman year, true freshman year, 338 attempts, average 10.8 yards per attempt, 59% completion percentage. So as a true freshman, that's really good. 53 touchdowns, 15 interceptions. And then his sophomore year, he only threw the ball 201 times, his junior 256, and his senior 193. 
and the completion percentage went down or hovered around 59%. And then the yards per attempt actually went down somewhere between eight and a half and nine and a half in those three seasons. And so when you put everything together, what you're really sort of looking at is a guy who profiles in my mind, a lot like a Malik Zaire or a lot like some of the guys we've had here before, where you look at like, you know, a Jacoby Brissett or even a Jeff Driscoll from their high school stats perspective. He's a little bit more mobile than I think you would expect just from sort of the, the fact that people talk about him as a pocket passer and those sorts of things. He, he ran for nine yards an attempt that true freshman season. If his true freshman season was his senior season in high school, I'd be really excited other than the completion percentage. But the fact that those are flipped does make me say, okay, was there development over the four years? Now, certainly there were some injuries there in high school that I think played a role in terms of the limitations and the number of attempts and those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, like, you know, his ranking is the four star ranking in this in this case, I think, is due more to arm strength than it is to decision making. And I think decision making is more important at the college level. So like you said, I you know, no one expects – um, a guy to come in and displace Anthony Richardson. If that was the case, if you were bringing in a guy to displace Anthony Richardson, obviously then you risk alienating both the fan base and Richardson when you do that. This is definitely somebody who's going to come in and push Richardson, I think, and I think is a insurance policy in case something happens to Richardson because we've seen you know, Richardson both in high school but now when he's gotten some regular playing time in college has been relatively injury prone. And so you can't – you know, he may be outstanding, but if he only plays half the games, you need somebody else to fill the time while he's gone, and, and Miller should be able to do that if, in fact, injuries continue to bite AR along the, uh, along the way. Uh, well, and then announced today for Fall Florida, Cameron Waits transfer from Louisiana. This one kind of out of nowhere as far as the transfer portal goes. Six foot eight, 358 pound offensive tackle. Let me read that again. Six foot eight. 358 pounds. That's the, that's uh, like, and there was some uh, word out there, you know, whether he's like, you know, six, seven, six, eight, six, nine around that range. Either way, you know, you, you, you're getting that. Uh, that's what 20, 24 seven sports had him listed at six foot eight. His official Louisiana page did not have a height on him, but they did have the 358 pounds on him. So I've just, everybody's kind of just marrying the two there. Six foot eight, 358 pound offensive tackle. Uh, latest addition to Florida's program as a transfer. Signed with Louisiana last summer, played in three games, participated in three games as a true freshman. He still has four years left uh, since he only played in those three games. From Dallas, Texas, uh, follows Billy Napier, of course, considered part of the 2022 class, second offensive lineman to sign, joining Christian Williams, uh, who was a commit to Louisiana, but then, of uh, course, flipped to Florida. Uh, and then – Add Jalen Farmer, who is also a commitment, who is signing in February along the offensive line for Florida. So, well, very uh, tricky one here. Prior to signing with the Raging Cajuns, did not report any additional scholarship offers. And Steve Wiltfong from 24 7, you have to go back uh, to about a year ago around uh, or, or when he committed. Uh, and, and signed with Louisiana. Steve Wiltfong for 24-7 Sports put out there that he has not played football since the eighth grade until he played as a true freshman uh, for Louisiana last year, played basketball on the prep level, big size, athletic, certainly a project, uh, but you got to believe Billy Napier saw something in him to allow him to transfer from Louisiana uh, to Florida when he's in this transition class here. Um, you know, Florida, Florida has a room overall roster numbers wise here. I don't mind this in the transition class. I don't mind the projects in the transition. Look, not trying to excuse the move here. Uh, everybody knows how critical we are in the world of recruiting when it comes to it here. Uh, but I find, find it hard to be that critical uh, as a transition class right now. This can't be happening uh, a lot starting the next cycle, but no issue, no issue with this kind of, um, six foot eight, three hundred and fifty eight pound project here, Will, on the offensive line. Yeah, so I think it's important what you said there. I have Florida right now, even with the signees that Napier has and then Miller transferring in at 74 scholarships, which means they got 11 left. Um, so there's an opportunity to, to, 
to really improve the roster via transfers. And if weights is part of that, then fine. The other thing is, is that I don't want to step too high, too hard on it. Cause Bill Sykes going to have something coming for read reaction on, on offensive mm-hmm. line pretty soon. But really, if you start looking at the numbers, there aren't a whole lot of guys. I mean, there are a lot of guys coming off the board pretty soon. I mean, you've got Garage, Ethan White, and Griffin McDowell, who are going to basically be eligible to leave after this year. You've got Iguakwin, Will Herod, Riley Simons, Josh Braun, and Michael Tarquin, who are going to be eligible to leave right after that. And then the next year, you've got Richie Leonard, and that's the only offensive lineman who's still on the still on the uh, the team from that particular class. And then you've got Yosef McGarbrill and, and Jake Slaughter and Austin Barber from last year's class. And again, not a whole lot of contribution to the team. And so, you know, Napier has made it a point to bring in guys on the offensive line. He brought in David Connor, Christian Williams, and, and Jalen Farmer there in the in the initial um, sort of foray of bringing people into the team. He also then focused on defensive line, right? So you got Chris McClellan and Jamari Lyons, as well as Shamar James at linebacker coming in. So he's clearly focusing on the offensive line, on the defensive line. And that's an area where Florida has struggled. The reality is if you start looking at SEC champions and playoff teams, and you look at the number of offensive linemen who make the all-conference teams for the playoff teams, I did this a couple of weeks ago. I was looking at all of the different you know, Clemson's and Ohio State's and even Cincinnati's of the world, two or three pretty much every time offensive linemen make that all-conference team. And Florida hasn't had an all-conference offensive lineman since Martez Ivy. And so, you know, when, when you start mm-hmm. thinking about, um, you know, when you start, maybe Juwan Taylor, but when you start thinking about, like, where where they're falling short, offensive line has been a place where they've fallen short. And some of that is John Hevesy. Some of that is recruiting. Some of that is, you know, taking projects for depth rather than projects with upside. And I guess that would be the hope here is that is that Waits is somebody. I mean, geez, he, you you retweeted a picture of him with with Katie <laughs> Turner today. And I mean, it it he's a big dude. Like Katie Turner isn't the biggest person in the world, but but Cameron Waits is a big guy. And so a big guy with basketball skills. Hey, you know, I mean, again, like you said, this is trust in Napier because the numbers suggest that you would you know tell him hey come over here as a preferred walk on and, mm-hmm. and you know we'll we'll see what'll happen but if Napier saw something in him then we'll see right now the good news is is that he's a 2021 commit and so from a eligibility standpoint you have time to develop him i think some of the other guys we might talk about who potentially can transfer over are not going to have that luxury that they'd have to come in and, and contribute right away typically that's what you look for from the transfer portal but when you're building up the program and when you have the scholarships that napier has that are going to be available i think you have the opportunity to probably take a shot or two all right, well, quickly, those transfers you're talking about, of course, uh, not breaking any news here, but put out there on Monday, two big names from Louisiana in the transfer portal. Guard Osiris Torrance, 6'5", 335-pound, three-year starter, two-time all-sum belt performer, and cornerback Makai Gardner, third-team all-sum belt selection uh, this season. You're getting contributors, Will, uh, there at the uh, – look, at the sum belt level. And, look, you really can – I mean, and you – know, um, Osiris uh, was, you know, has been on NFL draft boards. He was a top 100 ESPN player coming into this season. ESPN had him in the top 100 in all the college football. Uh, so, you know, if people will go back and look at a recruiting profile. Look, I'm sorry. Once you prove it on a college field, you can throw those recruiting rankings away Once, you, if you want to go back and start looking at players and, and, and what they uh, have done. When you're bringing them from straight from high school, by all means, go look at it. But when you've already contributed in college football, those results mean a whole lot more than whatever your recruiting profile did. So two performers here that Florida probably should, is in good shape for, probably more so Torrance, I would think, especially because of what we just discussed, all the need Florida has at offensive line and needing good offensive linemen. If Florida is able to pull Torrance here, I mean, he's an immediate plug, play, start. Yeah, I mean, so Pro Football Focus loves him. He was an all freshman in 2019. He started 19, 20, and 21. And so he'd be coming in with only one year of eligibility left, but he's also somebody that PFF had as an All American in, in 2021. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? I mean, you look at it and go, would here's the question I would ask would, would if Florida's offensive lineman went into the portal, would Louisiana be happy to take some of them? And as of right now, based on what's been proven on the field, I think the answer for many of them might be no. And, you know, at the end of the day, like you said, Torrance has proven on the field um, what he can do. I think Makai Gardner is a little bit of a different story. I think Florida is pretty, pretty, 
pretty comfortable when I look at the secondary, right? I look at the secondary and I go, you got Kamari Wilson and Devin Moore coming in. Jacoby Matthews potentially could come in at safety as well. You had Dakota Mitchell, Mitchell, Corey Collier, Donovan McMillan, Jordan Young, and Jason Marshall come in last year. So, you know, on offensive line, I sit there and I go, numbers make a difference. At defensive back, unless you think you've got a guy who's going to be a star, I don't really know that it's worth bringing somebody in who's going to come in and just be a depth piece um, you know, from, from a transfer perspective. And certainly, you know, Napier has been cognizant of his, the way he's perceived at Louisiana and coming in and taking a lot of the staff and then taking support, taking the coaching staff and then support staff and now sort of raiding the cupboard with, with transfers, I think will be looked poorly upon by people at Louisiana. And so I, I don't know that he's necessarily going to want to do that, but at the same time, you get an opportunity for a guy like Osiris Tor- Torrance. You say, okay, yeah, like we need that. He wants to come here. I know exactly what I'm getting. Let, let's do it. Um, Gardner, I don't know, right? I mean, obviously also all conference level player. Um, so it can be a difference maker, but. You know, and Will, as we record here, maybe still an outside shot. We haven't heard confirmed official word yet. Kyrie Elam going to the NFL, maybe a slim chance he comes back. You got. Elam, you got Helm, uh, Elam, Marshall, Helm. I mean, you, I think you start looking at it that way. I mean, a little well, different. Defen- yeah, defensive back is one place where Florida, like for all the criticism for recruiting, the recruiting hasn't really been that bad there. I mean, you know, like you mentioned, Kyrie Elam and Jadon Hill. It's Darius Perkins as a, as, as, a, uh, as a transfer. You got Mordecai McDaniel, Rashard Torrance, and Trevez Johnson at safety from a few years ago from that 2020 class. Finley Graham and Kamar Wilcoxon didn't play very much, but they're obviously there and, and have many years of eligibility. And then all the guys I mentioned, Mitchell Collier, McMillan, um, Avery Helm and Ethan Pouncey are still on the roster. So, you know, from the, from just a numbers perspective, like if you're gonna if you're going to use a scholarship, and I think that's really what it comes down to is you're talking about using a scholarship. So, a guy like Waits, you bring in, he's got three years of eligibility. That's almost like bringing in a kid from high school. And when you're talking about a transition recruiting class, hey, instead of taking a flyer on an offensive lineman that you don't know as well um, from a high school, bringing in a guy with three or four years of eligibility at the college level that you've already had an opportunity to know is valuable in, the, in, the, in terms of the culture of your organization, hey, okay, we'll take a flyer on that guy. But to have as many guys as they have in the defensive backfield and then use one of those scholarships on somebody else in the defensive backfield suggests that there are either um, – suggests that the recruiting on the defense in the defensive backfield for Napier in terms of the players who are already on the roster is not going as well as maybe he would like it to, because uh, at the end of the day, I think it's um, that's not an area of need for Florida. And if you're going to try to use the transfer portal build to build the team, there are other places of need. I think offensive line is clearly a place where I go, okay, that's a need. I think defensive tackle is a place where you go, okay, that's clearly a place of need. I think even wide receiver is a place where you'd say that's a position of need. I just look at it and I say, I don't think defensive back is an area of need. Um, and, and so I would not personally put a scholarship out for, I wouldn't use a scholarship there. I would try, I would count it back to, to 2023 and, and try to have an extra spot to sign somebody. Heck, Texas A&M has like 29 signees this class, right? I mean, if they do that next year, that's a better move long term for the foundation of the program than is bringing in a guy with a year or two of eligibility at the defensive back position, especially in a bump class too. So you take advantage and get numbers in a bump class. Ooh, yeah, talking, talking good there. Uh, well, we got plenty more to get into. I know we're kind of running a little bit long here. Staff hires, and we'll go. We'll take a look back at 2021 a bit. All of our preseason predictions, all our over unders. Uh, those predictions that for sure mostly went wrong uh, there and um, some of those uh, uh, the predictions that we have a lot of fun with. Uh, but before we do, looking for an easy New Year's resolution, make your goal to double your money and get a head start with my bookies deposit match bonus. All you have to do is use promo code Gators when you sign up and you'll get your initial deposit doubled up to $1,000 at mybookie.ag. With the extra dough in your account, you're ready to bet on the biggest games of the week, and my bookie has all the best action. One more bowl game left, LSU, Kansas State this week on Tuesday. Look, LSU doesn't even have a quarterback on the roster playing in this game. Only have about 40 players available <laughs> for a game versus Kansas State. Is that enough for you to take K-State? Also, plenty of time to get in for the national championship game for Alabama and Georgia. NFL playoff race in the final stretch. Plenty of high-state games to choose from. 
So don't drop the ball. Double your first deposit up to $1,000 by using promo code GATERS. Head to my bookie, place your bets, ring in the new year with a win, and bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Uh, well, let's uh, we'll quickly go through uh, a little bit of these staff hires. Uh, Newsy here, uh, of course, so I was trying to catch up for uh, not having a show uh, last week. Here we go, big one uh, for our own field. William Pigler joining staff as an assistant, coaching the tight ends. Tight end coach here, Pigler will head to Gainesville after spending two seasons as Michigan State's running backs coach, helping the Spartans finish the 2021 regular season with a 10-2 and two record, and reached their third New Year's Six Bowl game. Um, and Piegler, uh, you know, with that staff beat, um, you know, with that Michigan State staff, they end up beating Pitt, uh, of course, in the uh, Peach Bowl. Prior to Michigan State, Piegler was the director of quality control for the offense in 2019 at Colorado. Piegler spent the 2018 season, and here's the connection, spent the 2018 season as Louisiana's director of player personnel and quality control coordinator helping the Raging Cajuns recruit the number one class in the Sun Belt Conference in that year of 2018. Prior to Louisiana, he served as a graduate assistant at Georgia during the Bulldogs' run to the college football playoff national championship in 2017. Pigler worked with NFL first-rounder Isaiah Wynn, who earned first-team All-SEC honors as an offensive tackle that year in Athens. Pigler was also part of the staff that signed the nation's consensus top recruiting class for 2018. Well, when he left, even Mel Tucker, Michigan State's head coach, tweeted thanking Pigler for everything he has done at Michigan State for the Spartans, saying he gave everything that he had. So pretty good praise there. I think, you know, pretty good uh, showing, too, for, you know, when, when you're departing, that head coach to come out and tweet something positive about you as you're going to Florida. But Florida has found an assistant coach, found their tight end coach. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. He's obviously going to be compared to to Tim Brewster in terms of Brewster being one of the stronger recruiters on Dan Mullen's staff and Piegler. Um, he's going to have those shoes to fill, and we'll see whether he can do that. Now, I, I tend to think that recruiting is more heavily tied to the head coach than it is necessarily all of the assistant coaches. But one of the things I think you sort of see when you look at this staff in general is that except for the guys who have significant reputations – Billy Napier's bringing in guys who are young. And so mm-hmm. you look at a guy like Patrick Tony, you look at a guy like Darnell Stapleton, you look at guys like Ryan O'Hara, you look at guys like Kerry Colbert. Those are all guys who are in their 30s. And Piegler sort of fits that mold in terms of bringing in a guy in either his mid to late or mid to early 30s, really, um, compared to the other guys that are being brought in. Now, certainly you've got guys like Corey Raymond, you've got guys like Jabbar Jaluk who have a little bit more experience. And I think that's a valuable thing. But when you look at that, and you and you compare it to what we saw with Dan Mullen's staff. Dan Mullen's staff was less old and experienced and with a great reputation and then young and hungry. It was sort of much more constricted, right? Like the guys like even Mullen, I think, was like 43, 44 when he came in. But guys like Havasi and Gonzalez and things like that, we knew who they were. But I don't think they had like a stellar reputation, certainly not like Jamar Chaney or uh, or Corey Raymond. And then there wasn't sort of other than Christian Robinson, there wasn't really sort of that hungry, young, going to go out and recruit type of guys who are out there. So Piegler seems to fit that, obviously. Yeah, working with Sal, Michigan. Sal, Sal Sanceri was part of that first staff there for, for <laughs> Muller up front. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I had I had broken it down. I don't have it up in front of me, but I broke it down the ages. And it turns out that I think Florida, the age of Florida's coach when when Mullen came in was probably three or four years more experienced, I guess, than than the one that Napier's put together thus far. Um, and that sort of includes the guys that are rumored to come from the NFL when the season's over. But at the end of the day, it's not even necessarily that specific age difference it's that there's a much broader distribution of ages and a lot of guys in that 30 31 32 36 range that just were missing from the previous staff so whether that's good or bad i don't know right i mean a guy who's 40 has 15 years of experience on the guy that you bring in who's 25 who might be hungrier but is going to make mistakes and so you know hopefully what we see is some of these older guys can sort of guard against some of the mistakes and the younger guys are hungry enough to go out there and deliver on the trail but Piegler I think like you mentioned I mean obviously Michigan State's coach coming out and saying hey we appreciate what he's brought to the organization 
um, you know, it, it sounded very similar to the stuff that we heard from Louisiana in terms of what they were saying about Billy Napier when he left. And if there's one thing Napier has emphasized thus far um, since he's come to Gainesville is making sure that relationships are important and that, you know, that you're honoring your commitments and all those sorts of things. And so it sounds like Piegler fits right within that mold. And, you know, trust within a staff is an important thing. I mean, I think one of the things that we saw um, last year sort of come to a head was, and we saw it in some of the stuff that Neil Blackman wrote after the season, just in terms of it being a toxic work environment between the staff, um, between the on-field staff and and some of the support staff as well, but also I think between some of the on-field staff and, and, and the players. And hopefully if you've got trust and you've got sort of that general attitude that we're hearing from Napier leaving Louisiana, Pegler leaving Michigan State, then you're going to have um, – you're going to have success and be able to avoid some of those pitfalls that Florida sort of fell into last year. Now, uh, well, let's move forward. Paul Pascaloni, it was announced uh, he will serve uh, on the staff as director of advanced scouting and self scout. So look, getting creative with these titles here is Billy Napier and to fit and all fitting everybody in uh, on this staff, of course, veteran collegiate level professional ranks spent the last two seasons at Florida as a special assistant to the head coach under the previous staff. Uh, and Dan Mullen, of course, I mean, Syracuse uh, legend there, uh, uh, head coach there uh, as a head coach, 107, 59, and 1 as a head coach at Syracuse. Look, he came on the field once Todd Grantham was fired, helping Christian Robinson uh, lead the defense. Besides that first half of Samford, of course, we did see the defense get a little bit better. Uh, apparently, uh, Pascaloni was very instrumental uh, in, in some improvements that we saw on the defense after Todd Grantham left. But there – the – Pretty much the only pure football holdover uh, from the last staff. Of course, Vernell Brown also retained, but that's more for player relations, not the strategy part of the game. So Paul Pascaloni, the lone holdover on the staff uh, from Dan Mullen. We'll all keep it going here. Uh, Marcos Castro Walker will serve on, on the staff as director of player engagement and NIL. Spent the 2021 season at Nebraska as the program's director of player development. In his role, Castro Walker developed, implemented, and monitored an effective student mentoring program for Husker football student athletes. Prior to Nebraska, director of college personnel at Arizona State. Previously also worked in a similar role at UCF. Uh, so there's your, you know, one of your, he already had some meetings, uh, of course, about, you know, with some of the NIL features and angles to this. I know I had a meeting with members of the Gator Collective already uh, as well. So really trying to figure it out, getting a relationship between NIL and players out there uh, and, and all the engagement that comes uh, from that side of it. Uh, one of the headliners, uh, Will, coming from Louisiana, Bree Wade, director of on-campus recruiting and football events. She was announced as uh, spent the last two seasons with Napier at Louisiana, where she played a vital role in landing the number one recruiting class in the Sun Belt in back-to-back -back seasons. Joined the Raging Cajuns after spending the 2019 season as a football recruiting assistant at Mississippi State after serving as a graduate assistant in the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion in Starkville. She was also a student recruiting assistant for the Bulldogs from 2014 to 2018. So a little connection to the previous staff there uh, is Bree Wade before she went to Louisiana. So look, when recruits make their way onto campus, she will be very instrumental in setting everything up, making sure they have a good time uh, there. It will be, it will, it's a huge role to make sure the families, the recruits are all taken care of and entertained on these visits. That's something Florida has to change as far as when you look at how Georgia does things, how Alabama does things. When recruits take visits, there's a big difference there. Uh, I've, I've shared that. It recruits it feels different at those schools see why they recruit so well Bree Wade will be a huge instrumental part in making sure recruits are taken care of on their visits at Florida will the latest one that was announced today Bird Sherrill serve on staff as director of college personnel he's a native of Mooresville Alabama heads to Gainesville after spending the last six seasons with the Detroit Lions Sherrill first joined the Lions in 2016 spent his first two seasons in Detroit as a scouting assistant, most recently has served as a scout with the franchise. In his role with the Lions, he assisted with several player personnel projects, including evaluation and production of scouting reports, annual draft prep, and free agent acquisitions. Here's the kicker, Will. As Florida's director of college personnel, 
Cheryl will focus on the evaluation of transfer portal and JUCO players. So theme earlier in this episode, <laughs> transfer portal. Look, you've got to have somebody with the way the transfer portal is now. You have to have somebody dedicated to scouting it. Who fits? Who can you get? Bird Cheryl, Bird Cheryl will be part of that process. He's a 2016 graduate at the University of Alabama, started his career as a recruiting specialist with the Tide in 2013 as a student and was part of Alabama's 2014-2015 SEC championship squads and the national championship team of 2015 as well. So, all right, Will, there we go. Kelsey Gomes as well, sports nutrition. Florida has a, hey, a nutrition director. Once again, uh, they're was missing uh, after initial hire there for Dan Mullen in, in, in sports nutrition. Left, went away. Now Kelsey Gomes comes in. She's arrived from North Carolina where she oversaw the department, as well as baseball, men's basketball, field hockey, football, gymnastics, women's lacrosse, and volleyball since 2015. She returns to Florida. as She was the coordinator of sports nutrition for the Gators from 2012 to 2020. 15. So, Will, Billy Napier discussed he was hiring an army. These uh, hires come in fast and furious right now. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it's funny. I think Tom Thomas Goldcamp had an article where he was talking about, or maybe it was just a tweet, where he was talking about how it's not as though the number of assistants that Napier's brought in is dwarfing the number of assistants that that Mullen had though then then you and him I think we're also talking about where are they going to house all these people because they don't necessarily have oh, yeah. football offices <laughs> offices open so oh, that, was, that, that was Nick that Nick the that tweeted that part of it so I mean you know again I, I think there's a there the marketing here has been brilliant right that right after the that it's Every day you get a new one. Everybody gets excited. Now, at the same time, I think that, you know, I think Katie Turner is, is an excellent hire pulling her away from Georgia is, is great. I think Bree Wade is an excellent hire pulling her on campus and all the stuff you talked about in terms of making sure that the on-campus recruiting and football events are going well for all the recruits. All of that stuff is important, right? And the more we talk to or at least hear from recruits who were recruited under the previous regime, one of the things we hear is that they weren't necessarily communicated with consistently and you know that's going to be Turner and, and Wade's job to make sure that that happens, right? The thing I'm most excited about is exactly what you talked about in terms of you know having somebody who's going to be looking at the transfer portal specifically, having somebody who's focusing on NIL specifically. So where do you find an edge, right? I mean that that's really what those two positions are about is where do you find an edge? Because the reality is is that having having somebody make sure that the on campus recruiting events are as good as Georgia isn't getting you an edge. It's just getting you not getting beat like a drum by, by Georgia. So the things that's I get always, excited. Will, that's how I've always seen um, the facility. Everybody, oh, recruiting will be so much different. No, it just, it, 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 it makes you equal for those other schools. So then it's you've a, got to do the job. A, it's the same thing we say about recruiting, right? Like recruiting yeah. doesn't mean you're going to win, but it's a prerequisite to winning at a big time level yeah. consistently in college football. And so having people who make sure that the events on campus are awesome doesn't mean you're going to get the recruits, but it's kind of a prerequisite to being <laughs> able to get those recruits. And so I think you can say the same thing. Having somebody focused on name, image, and likeness doesn't mean you're going to have the best name, image, and likeness program in the country, but it's probably a prerequisite in this day and age to be able to get the the outcomes that you want for the recruits with NIL. Same thing with the transfer portal. Having somebody who scouts and the minute a name goes in the transfer portal, the first text, phone call, whatever that they get is from the University of Florida if that's a guy that they've already targeted all along. I mean, you know, the, the name I think of is, is Joe Burrow a couple years ago when everyone knew that if he lost to Dwayne Haskins in that quarterback um, competition at Ohio State, he was going to transfer. Well, the minute he puts his name in the transfer portal, who's the first person on the phone to get get in contact with him? And I don't know the answer to that, but I know it wasn't Florida. And, you know, I, I suspect that if you liked Burrow and if you thought you might need a quarterback and if you were going to go out on the transfer portal to try to fill that spot, that somebody like, um, you know, like the coach that you mentioned is going to be specifically assigned to make sure that the contact that Florida makes is right away. It's not going to seal the deal, but if it gives you an edge, that's important, especially when you think about how important relationships are when it comes to 
figuring out a way to get the best players to come to campus. So that's the thing that's decided to me. I mean, we won't know until two or three years from now, really, mm-hmm. how well these hires are. And really what we should hope for is that about a year, year and a half from now, after Napier blows it out of the park with a, with an awesome bump class, that all of a sudden these people are getting picked off one by one, you know, where, where a guy like Andrew Burkett, who's director of research and evaluation is now being promoted to some, Mm -hmm. um, you know, director of recruiting or something like that at a different organization. If you start seeing that, then you're like, okay, now this, now we know that even the people within the recruiting circles think that guy's doing a good job. And that's how you'll determine whether these guys are successful or not beyond just the raw numbers of the field. Uh, But again, I still think it goes back to Billy Napier has to be an outstanding recruiter (laughs) and you can have crap facilities or you can have awesome facilities but really what it boils down to is 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 the guy who has the ability to seal the deal able to seal the deal all of these people around him give him an edge in terms of being able to seal the deal they make sure that they don't screw the pooch before the coach ever gets an opportunity to talk to a player but once the coaches get an opportunity to talk to the player i mean those are the guys who are going to seal it those are the guys who are going to make sure they get on campus and all you're really trying to do at this point in many respects is not screw it up so that the coach has the ability to seal it at the end all right there we go catching you up on the hires there for the gators all the staff hires uh most off field and as i said well um on field still left potential as we look forward, hopefully, coming up soon, NFL season is going to play a huge role into this. Rob Sell, offensive line, Carl Scott, co-defensive coordinator, inside linebackers, uh, you know, kind of what we're looking at. Sell, of course, with the Giants, offensive line coach. Uh, there's Scott with the Minnesota Vikings, DB coach. Can you bring him in here as co-DC, inside linebacker? Eric Henderson with the Rams, defensive line, would be a huge coup, would be a huge get there for Billy Napier. And also – uh, Chris Rumpf, um, you know, rumored all these names rumored to be the next potential on field staff hires uh, for the Gators. So as we hit about an hour here, Will, let's wrap it up. Let's take a, our last look at the 2021 season. Yes, we have to, but yeah, it's a little bit more fun. We get to poke fun at each other and at ourselves, and we get to poke <laughs> fun at us too for how bad we missed on some of these over unders here and some of these predictions that we have for the 2021 season. Will, we did over under for 13 games. Uh, here for Florida. So that's exactly what Florida played this year with no SEC championship, regular season of 12 games and the bowl game. So where we started off, Emory Jones, 30 touchdowns. That's what we set it at. I went with the over, of course, and uh, the under is what hit. 23 touchdowns, 19 passing, four rushing. What hurt this the most, Will? How about those 13 interceptions from, from Emory Jones? Look, we knew of the struggles coming into the season, everything we had heard about Emory Jones and the lack of timing and accuracy and decision-making. He was never able to consistently overcome them. Thought the system and experience would be enough to overcome some of those worries that we had heard about from Emory Jones. Set the over-under at 30. He hit it the under with 23. Yeah, I think I took the over on that one too. The other thing that really killed us on that one is Pierce had 13 touchdowns. So <laughs> even though they never gave Pierce the ball, every time they gave it to him, apparently he scored. And uh, you know, those were those were touchdowns that Felipe Franks got back in 2018. And I think the expectation was is that, you know, sort of my memory of Franks is that South Carolina game where every time they got the ball inside the two or the three, all they did was run the quarterback lead. And or the quarterback power, and you know, Franks was able to get it in almost all the time. Um, they didn't do that this year. In fact, very rarely did they run the quarterback power down the red zone. They gave it to Damian Pierce and he scored, or they threw it and usually screwed it up in the red zone. So, um, you know, that that was the thing. Like, I if you'd have told me Emory Jones had 19 touchdowns through the air, is he going to get to 30 touchdowns for the year? I would have said he's probably going to be pretty, pretty close. But he wasn't, right? He ends up with 23 for the entire year, which really I think is a microcosm of the team is that they just could not convert in the red zone when Emory Jones was a quarterback. And part of that is that he was not effective running when they were down in the red zone. And that was something that I think neither one of us really saw coming. Correct. You are really correct there. All right. Then we went extended that one, Will. Quarterback position, 40 touchdowns. Well, since I thought Emory was getting 30, of course I went over there because I think we both thought Anthony Richardson would play. Uh, And 
of course, it was the under. You only have to add nine touchdowns from Anthony Richardson. That gives you 32 touchdowns for the pair, the duo of Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson. I think you can look at it and ask yourself, of course, what happens with no injury and or if Dan Mullen plays Anthony Richardson a bit more, maybe you get to 40 uh, in, in a different circumstance there. But, Will, 40 touchdowns, we asked ourselves from the quarterback position overall, it was under and not even close. I, th- I think we would have gotten there if Anthony Richardson had played the entire LSU game, to be honest with you, the way <laughs> the way he was going up and down the field. So we both did take under in this one. I think that was sort of, you know, the, the thought was some of the touchdowns were going to go the running. Oh, did I take under? I had a, no, no, no. I had a... You took over. I took under. This is okay. one of the ones I actually got right. Um, and my thought process was exactly what I said earlier about Pierce. Pierce had 13 yeah. touchdowns. I thought this was going to transition more to a running game. And so with a run centric game, those touchdowns would go to the running backs. The problem is, is that there just weren't as many touchdowns available that, that, uh, that we wanted. So, yeah. um, yeah, is what it is, but, uh, um, yeah, took the under on that one. All right. We asked ourselves any running back because, of course, Florida struggled running the ball coming in uh, to this season. So we asked ourselves any running back over under 750 yards. I said under. I didn't think any running back was getting 750 yards. That one hit. Wasn't even close. But it should have been, Will. All the running backs deserve more carries, especially Damian Pierce kind of going to your point there. He had 100, 100 carries on the season, 574 yards. That was the highest total of uh, from the running backs. Well, you saw this coming. I would go back and listen, listening to it a little bit. Not sure I saw Emory Jones leading the team with 758. So, you know, we asked ourselves, would any running back hit 750 yards? But a ball carrier did with Emory Jones barely getting 758. Uh, you wanted to include any ball carrier, Will. I'll let you have that when you got it right because you wanted to include Emory Jones with that one. So you you forecasted, you predicted that one a bit. So uh, you hit that one with Emory. Well, he squeaked it for me in the bowl game there, getting, <laughs> getting up to 758, that's for sure. But uh, no, nah, I mean, we always knew the, that the quarterback run game was going to be a big part. So yeah, that was one of my things when we did this was let's change the definition. Um, you know, it's funny as we're going through these, I'm realizing I wasn't quite as bad. So we'll see, yeah. we'll get there. There are other ones where I was definitely bad. But uh, now that one, I mean, I, again, I think <laughs> the thing that worried me was that Anthony Richards was taking away so many carries early in the year and so much yardage early in the year. I mean, geez, we were, we were probably six or seven Seven games in and well, Richardson was still that. It only worried you because of your prediction, not because sure. of your <laughs> Well, I mean, that and it's a bad thing when your backup quarterback is leading the team in rushing yardage like seven games into the year. And not playing. And, and he's and he hasn't played in like four or five of the games or has played sparingly in the games that he has been in. I mean, you know, he put up like 300 yards rushing in the first couple of games. So um I was excited about that, obviously, but then uh, not excited about the over under pick for there. But uh, you know, look, I mean, I think the Florida the Florida offense went as Emory Jones went on the ground. Mm-hmm. That was really sort of the story of the year. The only time he averaged more than six yards a rush and Florida lost was the game against Central Florida. Um, and there it was <laughs> a different set of failures at the quarterback position that caused Florida to not be able to win that one. But uh, you know, th- we knew that that was probably going to be the case that he was going to have to run to offset some of the shortcomings in the passing game. Um, and so, yeah, he was able to squeak it by for me. Uh, same here with the wide receivers. We asked ourselves any over or under wide receiver, 45 catches, the under hit here as well. Both Copeland and shorter, as I said earlier in the episode, 41 catches that led the wide receivers there. So no wide receiver. I picked the under, hit that one, Will. Neither Copeland nor Shorter. They led the team with 41, but they did not hit the 45 catches. Yeah, I picked the over here because I just assumed that one guy was going to be the go-to guy for one of the quarterbacks. And that just wasn't the case. And in fact, it seemed like one guy had one guy who was his go-to guy and and you know, Richardson had Copeland and, and Jones had shorter in terms of their go-to guys. And they both end up at 41. So, um, you know, rough year for the wide receivers. That's for sure. No. All right. Offense, 35 points per game. The reason we set that at 35, go through the history here with Dan Mullen's offense, 2018, 35 points a game, 2019, 33 points, 33.2, 2020, of course, 39.8 Took the under, got that. 2021, the Gators averaged 30.7 points per game. Five less, four or five less than what we picked there. In year four, Will, Dan Mullen's recruits, 
a specifically recruited quarterback for his system, and it garnered the lowest output of the Mullen era at Florida. 30.7 points per game when we set the over-under at 35. But I, I, did, I didn't hit it. I didn't think they hit it. Yeah, so I had under on that one too, mainly because last year's squad was really good and yeah. only scored 40. So I was like, you know, you're prob- the value of an elite quarterback is like six or seven points per game. So you subtract that from 40 and you end up in the 33 to 34 range. And to be honest, that is where Florida was on track to be mm-hmm. after the LSU game. And then all of a sudden the wheels just fell off offensively and and really with the entire team. Um you know, it's funny, like we're going to get to the defense in a second, but at the end of the day, the offense, other than the Kentucky game, played pretty well for the first half of the year, and then everything fell off on the back end. But, uh, you know, 31 points a game isn't anything to sniff at. I think that's one of those things where we sort of take for granted the offensive and the inefficiencies that we saw this year were certainly frustrating. At the same time, the um, – We've seen worse inefficiencies under under both McIlwain and Muschamp, and so you know the days of scoring twenty points and like struggling to score nine against Vanderbilt are over, or at least were over. But uh, obviously, not good enough for what Florida fans expect. Absolutely. All right, we'll move to defense. We set that one at twenty and a half over under for the defense. I picked they would go over that. They would not average better than 20 and a half points per game. Will, it was at 26.8, basically 27 points per game for the Florida defense, an improvement from 2020, but uh, nowhere, nowhere near where it needed to be. Of course, Grantham gets fired during the season, and we need to rehash that. But the only reason we're rehashing this is because we got to go back and look at how we did uh, with our with our preseason predictions. But they get this one right as well, as I didn't think Florida would. Look, in 2018, 20 points per game. 2019, 15 and a half points per game. Then that doubled in 2020 to 30.8, as I said. Did get better but about, by about four points, 30.8 in 2020 to 26.8 in 2021. Well, it's funny because I didn't think the defense was necessarily going to be better. I just thought that they had a better set of opponents. So, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you looked at Samford, FAU, and USF, but they really weren't that great against FAU and USF, and they were downright atrocious giving up 52 against Samford. So, I mean, if they'd have shut out Samford, FAU, and USF, they would have been really close to that 20 and a half. Yeah, hey, good point. Good point. <laughs> so, so, I mean, now granted, um, you can't give up 52 to Samford. That's one of the reasons why Todd Grantham and Dan Mullen are no longer in Gainesville. But, uh, but yeah, I had taken the under because I thought that the schedule was going to make them yeah. look better than they are, even if they weren't as good as maybe people wanted them to be. Uh, but no, they were just bad and bad. Well, go back like and look at it. The game. greatest accomplishment for this defense was what they did versus Tennessee. Yeah. And, what Tennessee and what Tennessee did to themselves in that game a little bit too. Their opportunities were there, but uh, still, when you saw what Tennessee did this year, you know, how, if you go back and look at it, I don't know how far they ever won that game. I got to be honest, man. I went back, You like you said, you alluded to it. You and you and I were talking about Patrick Tony and some of the things he does on the defensive side of the ball. I went back afterwards and looked at Grantham's game plan against Alabama and and just wanted to, like, you know, shoot myself in the face after watching that game plan because I'm sitting there going, wow, that's like the complete opposite of everything that I just listened to when it comes to Patrick Tony. So a welcome change on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and, you know, I had more confidence in Todd Grantham than other people did, certainly. Uh, I did too. To you, like, but right, remember, right before the season, you 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 did put that article out that really showed should we really expect that big of an improvement from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one? And you that that article really taught me off the ledge because I going back to off season, you listened to me during the summer. I was pretty high on the defense uh, as far as rebounding, but then really breaking down what happened in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen, you could see where that was a little bit of you know false bravado. Uh, I guess when, when, when I go back and look at it, but um, so where were you when I took the, where were you when I took the under there, buddy? You should have said, <laughs> "Hey, wait a minute." <laughs> I'll let you dig your own grave there a little bit, uh, but yeah, I mean, as he said, no more. Hopefully, blitzing from Jacksonville um, from, from 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 this defense now. Uh, when, when we come look, come and look at it. All right, well, we'll our last over under as far as stats go: thirty seven sacks. You know, Florida's been this getting sacks, living in the backfield as far as sack numbers go under Todd Grantham. 37 sacks, 
Well, we probably should have put a half on that one, Will, because it was right at 37 for the Gators. Uh, I picked the over. as uh, I picked the over every year, I think, and, and have gotten that one right. Uh, but right on the dot, 37 sacks uh, this year. Brenton Cox, eight and a half. Zach Carter, eight. Uh, there he goes to 16 and a half sacks. Just the, that, those two guys alone set the over under at 37, and that's exactly what Florida got. Well, Christian Robinson screwed me on this one because they, <laughs> they once they switched from Grant to C Rob, all of a sudden guys were sacking people like it was nobody's business. Um, I've gotten this one wrong every year I've done it. And so a push, <laughs> I'll take it. Like every year I'm sitting there going, Oh, Grantham's not going to be able to replace all the sacks from the guy he had guys he had last year. And all of a sudden he's able to do it. So that was what I I I predicted that they were going to go over this year. Um, and of course I get the push the one year that I don't, the one year that I decide to pick over, I get the push. But, uh, again, as long as it means that we have a new defensive coordinator, I'm all in favor of being wrong on any of these. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll go through just some of these, uh, superlatives that we put out there too. ultimate game changer. I was way off. Uh, I, I said trading, uh, on that one. That was more of a kind of a prediction, hoping that that move to safety would be the difference he needed. Um, uh, there to make a difference in the in, in the defense. Started the season off okay, then as the season played along, as you can see, you know, I think opposing offenses just figured uh, that one out. Of course, the ultimate game changer, even in limited action, ended up being Anthony Richardson. Yeah, I had Diabate as the ultimate game changer. I thought he'd shown flashes and was going to be much, much better, and it turned out that I think the, the flashes were – were an outlier when it really sort of came to his performance. It wasn't that he was bad, but it wasn't that he wasn't, it was exactly that he wasn't a game changer. And so, um, you know, a solid player, but not somebody that I'd say is a star looking at his performance in 2021. Yeah, kind of going off the top of my head with this. I took some notes on this, but I got, I guess I didn't save or whatever. Best tandem, I had picked Emory and AR. Whoops. Uh, got half of that, right? But um, <laughs> I think uh, we'll going back and looking at it. As I just I just put out the sack numbers of Cox and Carter. You, you had 16 sacks between those two guys. You know, there was if you want to look at a best tandem, there are really not a lot of places to look. So I think it for me, Damian Pierce Malik Davis. That's probably where I'd go if you had to pick a pick a tandem for this Gator team. Yeah, I think I had Jones and Richardson for the episode. And one of the things that I said was Richardson's going to play, and I think he's going to end up being a significant part of the game plan every week. And boy, could I have been more wrong. <laughs> Basically, he's good enough. He should have been the part of the game plan every week, but he wasn't. Um, I actually think if you look at the best tandem, it was Ky probably by the end of the year, it was Kyrie Elam and Jason Marshall. Those were the yep. two guys yep. where I looked at and said, hey, yep. Like maybe not, not early in the year, but by the end of the year, those were the guys who, when you asked me, who do I trust the most on this team? Those are the two guys that say, um, you know, they're going to show up every day, every week. And you even see it. If you look at the past statistics for the defense, as bad as the defense was, the past statistics, actually, I think it was, uh, you know, our, our buddy, one very 157 Gale over there on Twitter was talking about, uh, you know, he was surprised where Florida wound up in the passing statistics and, you know, guys like Torrance and, and Trevez Johnson, and and then Marshall and Helm and Elam were actually pretty good. The problem is, is that we couldn't stop anybody up front. So um, and they gave up some backbreakers as well, but still um, thought they were probably the the guys I trust the most by the end of the year. All right, breakout player. I had picked Trent Rittimore to go along with that breakout player. You have to, you know, look, ultimate game changer. I put AR in breakout player had to be him as well. Um, of course, just limited action last year in 2020, 2021. When he got a shot, of course, was definitely the breakout player. Yeah, I had Gene DeLance here. I was uh, convinced <laughs> that on the offensive line, and to be honest, early in the year, it really first half of the season. Like yeah, well, yeah, first half, the first month of the season. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and look, I think at the end of the day, from where he was at the end of 2020 to where he was this year, I think he was better. Uh, yeah, but I think you could sort of say that about most of the Gators. You could say, hey, certainly some people improved, some people didn't. But at the end of the year, I didn't look at it and say, wow, that guy's indispensable. Um, you know, that's part of the reason why none of them were on the all SEC team. So DeLance wasn't necessarily a breakout from the standpoint of he wasn't a star, but he also wasn't a liability this year. And I think in many ways that was actually a significant step forward. All right, biggest shoes to fill. Look, we said quarterback was obvious. That did not happen. I said Jacob Copeland just because of losing Kyle Pitts, losing Kadarius Tony. He had the biggest shoes to fill. I think he'd probably still go that route, Will. And this one's more of basically just how it turned out, not really anything to do uh, with, with the season. So I had picked Jacob Copeland for biggest shoes to fill. 
Uh, and as I said, led the team in catches, but you know, a lot of drops uh, at times. Quarterback play didn't help him out uh, e- either, but uh, entire offense, honestly, we'll – Going back and looking at it, of course, the, the entire offense had the biggest shoes to fill uh, for for this Gator team. Nowhere close to consistent success on that side of the ball. Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious to both of us that the biggest shoes to fill were Kyle Trask's. Um, you know, really, since Tebow had left, it had been a wasteland of a position. And yeah. but but I you had to and- go quarterback. You know, I didn't want to be the boring. Uh, you know, of course, quarterback is the biggest shoes to fill. But that's you let me be. You let me be the boring one. That's the, that's <laughs> the way this works. But uh, no, one of the things I do remember saying is is that you know while Tony was fantastic at receiver, I thought he was in many ways sort of the heart of the team. And I do think they missed that this year, right? Not necessarily Mm -hmm. that he could get open whenever it was third and five. That was certainly a big part of things. But I remember being injured in that LSU game. And, you know, you think about that game being uh, the game where you've obviously got the shoe toss, but then you've also got Kyle Pitts sitting out to sort of get an extra week before the Alabama game. And Kadarius Tony's out there getting injured on the final drive and sort of limping his way through it as he's the only guy, Kyle, the only guy Kyle Trask threw the ball to on that final drive in the last, like, what, 24 seconds or whatever, where they drove it down the field. And then sort of my enduring image of that game is the fog where he's where he's mm-hmm. kneeling on the actual logo at the end. And, you know, I think I'm not sure that until that moment I had appreciated Kadarius Tony and what he brought to the program. But I think some of that attitude is something that the team missed and maybe is something that we missed early on in terms of thinking about whose shoes needed to be filled, not necessarily from a performance perspective, but just from a an effort standpoint on the offensive side of the ball, especially. All right, well, to end this, we both we gave a bold prediction. Of course, most bold predictions don't come true, but bold prediction Gators win the SEC East. Oh, not even close. Not even close. Next to dead last in the SEC East uh, for the Gators, and uh, that was the that was the bold prediction from 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 my side of it, Will. But uh, not look. I picked Georgia SEC media days. Of course, I didn't think Florida was winning the SEC East, but that was a bold bold prediction. Yeah. So my prediction, I have to eat some crow here because I. Uh... I may or may not have said that Florida wasn't just going to beat Georgia, but they were going to take Georgia behind the woodshed <laughs> <laughs> and that we were going to be able to make 1980 chance for one more year because Florida was going to do that. It turns out I was right. It was just, I was talking about Alabama and they were, <laughs> they were going to take Georgia behind the woodshed in the SEC championship game. So obviously couldn't have well, been. And hopefully they do one more time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We will all be rooting for that coming up on Monday. But uh, um, yeah, that was my bold prediction. Obviously, I put the kibosh on the uh, on the Gator season. It's all my fault. Um, if I'd have said we were going to lose to Georgia as my bold prediction, um, if, maybe if my bold prediction had been after the Georgia game, more people will want Dan Mullen gone than than Todd Grantham. Then then maybe we would have had a successful year and everybody would have hated me. But uh, you know, yeah, I'll have to eat some crow on that one. Georgia certainly stuck to Florida and proved me wrong. <laughs> uh, but maybe my bold prediction should have been uh, testy press conferences. That would have been <laughs> that, would have, that would have been one. <laughs> the uh, I, I will have to say you are uh, I, in in Gator media lore. You should be high up there because the second <laughs> time you ticked off Mullen in his press conferences, like the next day, they're like, "We're going away from Zoom." Like we're just not doing zoom anymore. It's all going to be in person. And I'm like, ha, well, like that means you can't get down there from Jacksonville. So it's, yeah. Yeah. I just, that was after they had shut down media media about uh, the rest of that week. Yeah. So, so congratulations, Dave, on getting Florida back to normal non COVID protocols. This is really a, uh, it's a stellar job by you of making sure that uh, you know, that everybody could get back to some sense of normalcy after the pandemic. Oh man. Oh man. What a, what a crazy year. What a crazy year. Yes. Well, but we'll look, we'll look forward to 2022 now. Um, as with that, that would look, well, that's pretty much going to be our last look at, at a, at a Dan Mullen team going back and looking at our uh, crazy predictions and over unders and stuff. Something we do every year. That's a lot of fun. Like really like going back and looking at it at the end of the year, but it's no fun if you don't go back and look at it. No, exactly, exactly. We can we can laugh at ourselves here. So, all right, yeah, a lot of a lot of fun there. A lot of a lot of hopeful fun in 2022 here. As uh, as I said earlier in this episode, we got plenty to look forward to. We'll dive into offense, defense, 
uh, coming up. Uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. Like, uh, remember we did that last year uh, where we gave a kind of a preview of a, an early preview of the offense and the defense uh, in each side of the ball. So we'll do that again coming up here soon uh, on Gators Breakdown. We got to we gotta let all this stuff play out, Will, of, uh, of the transfer portal and all that stuff coming up uh, in the next week or so. So, uh, yeah, pretty much transfer portal. I mean, with classes starting and add drop later on this week as well, you should. Uh, we should be getting all these answers. Uh, who's leaving Florida with the transfer portal and who's coming in as well. So, um, Will, um, you led us at Read Reaction. I know you and I, we caused a big stir on Twitter. I mean, not not just us. I mean, everybody kind of has a, a thought on opt-outs, holdouts, and sit-outs for bowl games. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a little something about it. I tried to actually think about it in terms of a more holistic way and say, all right, why are the players doing this? And beyond just the fact that it's about money, like how do you fix it? And not just fix it from the standpoint of, you know, the bulls need to be fixed, but but how do you fix it from the standpoint of getting the players and the programs to trust each other so that if a player is injured, he feels like the program's going to have his best interest at heart and, and those sorts of things. And, I, you know, one of the things um, – I don't think the Bulls are struggling this year in terms of viewership. In fact, um, somebody tweeted me right before we came on and with some statistics that says the Bulls are still making money. The ESPN still getting good ratings. And in some ways that's true, right? That the Bulls are sort of there to be on in the background so that when your uncle starts talking politics, you can change the, change the subject. Um, <laughs> And Boy, I, felt, and, I felt that way at the holidays. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's, 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 you got somebody with the red hat and you got somebody with the purple, with the purple stocking hat talking to each other in the same room. It's like, Hey, what's going on with this Auburn game over here? Like, that's one of the reasons why that, that exists at the same time. I do think that's one of the things that major league baseball said probably, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when they moved all their world series games to eight, eight 30, nine o'clock. And the reality is, is that a generation later, look at where baseball is. And I don't want that to happen to college football. And so from the standpoint of having a quality product on the field, that matters. And, uh, you know, whether it's impacting the bottom line today, that's a short term win for potentially a long-term sacrifice. And that's sort of what I was writing about was, uh, was that, but uh, you know, more than anything, I just hope Matt Corral's okay. It looks like it's just a sprained ankle, yeah. which is good. He'll be, he'll be good. I mean, obviously, you know, you always fear that somebody's going to come out of there with like a torn ACL or a torn patella or something like that when they get rolled up on. So the fact that it's just a sprained ankle, cause that was sort of what started it is Joe Tessitore was talking about endlessly how Matt Corral was doing things the right way, coming back and playing in the bowl game. And about the 37th time that he said that, then Corral gets rolled up on it and twists his ankle. And then you had Herb Street earlier in the day talking about how guys didn't love the game anymore and that sort of stuff. So um, I think there's more nuance to it than that, right? I think yeah. Herb Street and Desmond Howard have some points in terms of the fact that college football has changed. But I think who they're blaming for the change is a little bit misguided. And that's sort of what I wrote about. Hmm. Good stuff there. Readreaction.com. That's where you can find Will's latest. And um, a lot of good stuff there. So, Will, like I said, Tuesday, as I said, we'll get M Mama D. Bate's announcement, see if he's going to stay at Florida or leave. I, look, I'm going to assume if he was leaving, he'd probably make that decision already. I'll make a prediction D. Bate stays. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see where it goes there. Be on the lookout for that. So whenever you listen to this, I don't know when he just said he's going to make the decision on Tuesday. Didn't really give a specific time. So whenever you listen to this, you may already know the answer uh, there. So, all right, that is Will Miles. You can find him on Twitter at Will Miles SEC. Find him at a site, Read and Reaction on YouTube, Read and Reaction as well. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.